Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're here today with Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. Brenda is recognized internationally as one of the foremost thought leaders of reconciliation and was featured as one of the 50 most influential women to watch by Christianity Today. She's the co-author of The Heart of Racial Justice and the author of A Credible Witness, Roadmap to Reconciliation 2.0, and Becoming Brave, Finding the Courage to Pursue Racial Justice Now. Her new book is titled Empowered to Repair, <clears throat> Becoming People Who Mend Broken Systems and Heal Our Communities. Brenda is Associate Professor of Reconciliation Studies in the School of Theology at Seattle Pacific University, where she directs the Reconciliation Studies program that prepares students to engage the culture around them as Christian reconcilers. She earned an MDiv from Fuller Theological Seminary, a DMIN from Palmer Theological Seminary, and was awarded doctorates of humane letters from both North Park University and Eastern University. She's an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church, and is on the pastoral staff of Quest Church in Seattle, Washington. You can learn more about Brenda and all of her work at saltermcneil.com. That's S-A-L-T-E-R-M-C-N-E-I-L.com. So, Brenda, congratulations on all of your wonderful work, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. The pleasure is mine, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to get this chance to talk with you. Yeah, yeah. It's so wonderful to reconnect, and, you know, I've always been a fan of all the books that you've written and the work that you've done, so uh, I was really glad to hear that there was a new uh, book coming out. <laughs> so yeah, it was this pretty- one. This one came hard, but it was a, it came from my heart because it felt like it was necessary. So yeah, you and yeah. you and I came well, hard. I mean, I, all your books do. I mean, your last book, Becoming Brave, I really felt that way too. So I mean, yeah. So um, is there anything else that you'd like people to know about you than what I kind of touched on there? No, I'm married, have two children who are young adults. I care for them very, very much, and I think um, my own care for. Uh, young adults, both as a college professor and as a parent, and I'm also at a church that attracts a younger um, kind of audience that's asking new questions. I know that this book for me was prompted by that generation and their a bit of disenchantment with the church, right? So um, I wanted to try to hear more clearly what is this generation asking for, of us? Because every generation has new questions, and I think we have to always lean our ear into what are the questions that are coming up in this day and time, and and how do we respond to them? So that's where my passion came for, from for this particular book. Wow. Well, you know, um, thank goodness that you're paying attention, right, you know, to that audience, and also that you're so intertwined with it between your church and your pro- professorship, you know, I mean, all the things that you get to do at school. So, I mean, a lot of us don't have that kind of direct um, and deep communication, you know, with that audience. So um, uh, I think that allows you to help the rest of us learn. (laughs) (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) So let's talk about, you know, the book, Empowered to Repair, Becoming People Who Mend Broken Systems and Heal Our Communities. How did the actual book itself come about? Well, I tell a story early on in the book. Um, I I think, first of all, it was the story was that I, I had a young person in my life, back to young adults, right? Uh, I met him at a conference. Uh, he talked about reparations all the time, so much so that I dubbed him Brother Reparations. I just gave mm. him a nickname because he always talked about it. Long story short, he was on the committee of an organization that was bringing Brian Stevenson to mm. uh, Seattle. Mm. And so I got a ticket because my dear young friend had, was on the committee. He gave me a ticket. I got there and I was looking forward to this presentation. It was excellent. And at the end, uh, Mr. Stevenson, Brian Stevenson opened up the conversation for questions. The very first hand to go up with my young guy friend who's and I I was sitting next to someone I knew and I said to her I don't know what he's going to ask but it will have something to do with reparations you know and sure enough Brian Stevenson called on him he said Mr. Stevenson do you believe in reparations and I just thought I knew it that's just what he does right it's his thing long story short Mr. Stevenson said this Brian responded by saying of course I do but anyone can write a check Real reparations would be to repair what's actually broken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was a very insightful Mm -hmm. thing for me to hear. He went on to say, for example, 
in this country, African-American people were not given the right to vote. So to repair that, all African-Americans would automatically be given the right to vote on their 18th birthday. That would repair what was actually broken. As I left that conference and was in my car, a scripture came to my heart and mind. Isaiah 58, 12, and you shall be called the repairers of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. I don't know when's the last time I read that text, but my gosh, it came up out of nowhere. And that became the beginning of me asking the question, oh, repair, repairers of the breach. Yes. This is not some newfangled kind of, you know, and movement that we're just starting. We've been called as the people of God to work toward repair. And that's how this book got started for me. Wow. Wow. Well, William Barber's organization is called Repairs of the Breach, I think, isn't it? I'm not sure, but I know he's been doing that work for a very long time. Yeah. 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 There's a couple of other reparations books. Um, one that's just kept coming out, um, Creating a Culture of Repair from uh, Reverend Robert Turner. I'm mm -hmm. going to be doing an interview with him soon. And then a couple of years ago, there was a a book just called Re Reparations. I, I can't remember the subtitle of it, but Duke Kwan and I think it was Greg Thompson. Yes, I think so. And I have that one. Yeah. That was just an excellent book. Um, you know, but um, there needs to be more said, obviously, about this topic. So, I mean, your book really adds to where <clears throat> some of those other people started. And if we trust the whisper, <laughs> it, it interests me that you've heard this topic coming up from more than one place. Oh, yeah. Right? So that's a sign that maybe, just maybe, God's starting to talk to us a bit. <laughs> As the people of God who are supposed to be on mission for the kingdom of God, maybe we've missed something, and maybe we're getting a little nudge from the Spirit to say, you talked a lot about reconciliation, but it's become a bit more relational and now we need to look at how are you systemically addressing the issues that need to be repaired. Those two have to go together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another one of our friends, Lisa Sharon Harper, um, you know, has been involved in this work in D.C. Um, Absolutely. And um, I was part of an event that she sponsored, led, um, that had uh, Barbara, oh boy, I can't remember her last name, the congresswoman. William Skinner. I think so. Yeah. She's uh -huh. a sponsor of this HR 40, oh, which is to yes. establish a committee on repar reparations. Yes. Uh huh. I've heard of it. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's another one of these things that has been languishing, unfortunately, you know, not gotten um, the kind of support that it needs to really go forward, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think part of what I'm trying to do, and uh, Brian, you know me well enough, I try to call us as the people of God rooted in in Scripture, because I think when we hear those words, something in us gets frightened. Reparation sounds like some political, social, active, you know, activist kind of push back on the government. And that's not my intent. That's not what I believe we're called to. I believe that when we stand up for righteousness and for justice, we're called to be those people. And I think we've got to reclaim that, understand that, uh, un untie it from whatever rhetoric that's happening in the, you know, political, social fear spheres around us so that we can just be God's people on mission to okay. do the things that heal our land you know, so that all people can reach their full God-given potential. That's who we are, and that's what this generation is looking for from the church, the yeah. people who call themselves the ecclesia, the called-out ones. We're supposed to represent what the kingdom looks like. Well, you know, I agree with you. I think, you know, the word reparations um, a while back was kind of one of these third rail kind of a term, you know, but it seems like it's get, getting more acceptance, a little, a little bit more broadly um, listened to than yeah. what it was, you know, a few years ago. It's my perception. At least. Yeah, I think so. And uh, I think that's why we've got to look at it as repair. Yeah. Because and to root it in scripture, repairers of the breach, restorers of streets <clears throat> to dwell in. So we're not just in this world to have a, you know, kumbaya party with each other. We're here to repair the brokenness around us through the power of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So who, when you wrote the book, did you feel it was most intended for? Yeah, I, I, I said earlier, and I'll say again, I'm writing to Christians, and I know that. 
I'm writing particularly to an, a generation of Christian young leaders coming up behind us for whom they look to us for the wisdom, the lived experience, the insight we can give, right? And so I have in mind those of us who want to be helpful to the generations coming behind us to give them a starting platform that is rooted in scripture that affirms their desire to see the world be a better place. So, you know, I've had the pleasure of interviewing you for a few different books now. It feels to me like you're on a trajectory of sorts. Do you, do you see it that way too? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I think that my journey, and that's that's just true of who I am. You know me well enough to know I don't write books just to write them. And so basically, if I if I take the work of putting something in, in writing and, and working toward publishing it, it's because I'm learning insights that have, one, first changed my life. And I slowly on this traje tra trajectory of continual learning, keep trying to say, oh, that's the missing piece. Oh, that's that's what needs to be added to this conversation. Oh, that would push us toward the movement that we say we want to have. So those things get to, for me, in a way that I can't go around the country and preach it all out. So for me, I try to take the concepts that I understand, because I believe that we as the people of God want to do a better job. I'm not sure we know how. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why we write, so that we can give people practical principles that they can put into action so that we can demonstrate what it looks like to be kingdom kingdom people, followers of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I'd like to read from a couple of the endorsements from the book. Um, this is from our good friend Patricia Rabon, who says, uh, Dr. Brenda's bravest, most urgent, and most wise, yet hopeful and strategic guide and pronouncement to date. An inspiring triumph. So I love hearing that from Patricia, first of all. <laughs> um, um, how, how, how do you see it as strategic? I think the strategic part is back to the practicality of it, you know. I think we can call people to things, but unless we give them steps and clear um, concepts that they can actually implement, it's a rally call, it's a prophetic rally call, but it doesn't empower people to do the work. I think that's what makes it strategic. So it's entitled Empowered to Repair, Becoming People Who Mend Broken Systems and Heal Our Communities. I wanted to empower people. This was not about me showing what I know. It's trying to use what I know to empower others to do this work mm. to, as, as, the, as a community. How do we do this work in ways that we see healing and wholeness result from it? So I think that's the strategic nature of what I've tried to do here. Mm. So um, another word that Patricia used is hopeful. And, you know, personally, I see it as frustrating that reconciliation and reparation have not happened more quickly and more pervasively. And I know that sentiment is deeply felt, you know, in the African-American community. Um, and I totally understand. But what hope do you see going forward? I have hope in the generation coming behind me. Just like people who saw us when we were in college and in graduate school, they saw us as having the energy. So scripture says that God calls us calls the wise because we know the way, the old because we know the way, and the young because they're strong. I have hope that this that this generation who has access to so much information, both nationally and globally, I believe that they see what needs to, that that there's a need for change. And I believe that that that's that that sense of clarity that this is not the way God would have this world be. And so I see I see hope in Christian students who are standing up for what they believe. I see hope in people who are willing to engage systems and structures to try to make it better so that people can actually live and they're, they're, they're naming it. So I think that there for me is a hope that one, God is active in human affairs, two, that I do believe that there is always a, 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 a remnant of people who are, are God's a agents who are used in this earth as salt and light. I just believe that. I believe that even though things look pervasive, God always has a witness. I get hope from believing that God is active and moving amongst us. And God uses human beings like us, as frail and as foible as we may be, to get the job done in the generation that we find ourselves. And I pray that that is how we approach life. We can't change everything, but we can change something. Mm -hmm. And I think we should all give it a try. Well, that's that's good that you see, you know, that kind of hope within, you know, the younger generation. Um, 
very good to hear and good to know. Um, <clears throat> another endorsement from the book comes from Randy Woodley, who says, Empowered to Repair is the sum of sage wisdom from a lifelong reconciling. For those awaiting the tools to make a better world, you found them. So obviously he's pointing to tools. And I know you said that was an important part of, you know, your, what you wanted to provide. Um, what are some, maybe a couple of the more practical uh, tools that you're offering? Yeah, well, it, I use the narrative of Nehemiah. So I always try to find a muse in scripture that helps me look for how did we do it? Because, and this gets me all riled up, and I want to say this to start. One of the big ahas that I had about our, our, our approach to problems and, and justice and reconciliation as evangelical Christians is that we have been discipled through an individualistic approach to our faith. So you'll just hear us say things like, Jesus Christ is my personal savior. I gave my heart to Christ. Jesus came into my heart, right? And those things are true. But it's a very individualistic relationship, right? So when someone talks about justice or reconciliation or racism or, or you know, sexism or whatever the, the divisiveness is in our culture, people will say, I love everybody. Do you hear that? I have friends in, you know, uh, who are from another racial background. I can speak another language. And so our solutions to to, to systemic problems have been individualistic. Mm -hmm. And that is not getting us the results we, we seek, right? Yeah. So we're trying to convert folks one person at a time in hopes that we'll get enough of a mass, you know, group of people and then something change will happen. No, we need to see, like I believe we saw in the civil rights movement, that our faith it's not just an individualistic faith. We are the people of God, not the person of God. And we are on mission for the kingdom together. Every tribe, every nation, we need each other. So Nehemiah was a book where he brought a lot of people together from different walks of life, different life experiences, different ex uh, abilities, different uh, genders. He just brought this whole coalition of people who saw a common problem and he showed them how to organize and work together to, to fix it, repair it. And that's what made the book of Nehemiah intriguing mm. to me because mm. the tools are the kinds of questions that we have to ask about how do we move from a individual to a collective approach to repairing the brokenness around us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree that that's what's needed. <laughs> um, it's I'd not love just, to hear why you think that too, because I believe oh, it's that. Just, it's just not, you know, enough for us to say, okay, well, I'm a Christian. End of story. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it hasn't worked. No. And that's, and that's why this is more strategic, because I, I now understand that's the problem. We came to faith through an individualistic door, and that has shaped in us an individualistic perspective. Even though we do church in community with each other, we make decisions through an individualistic lens. And we've got to think more from a collective perspective and work together to see ourselves as, as intertwined. And that's how we witness the kingdom of God on earth. That's what we've got to do together. And so Nehemiah hears some really disturbing news. So one of the first practical tools is he asked questions. He, he when when his countrymen came to visit, his first question was, how are things going? What's happening there? I'm far enough away and removed now that I don't have eyes on things. I don't know what's actually going on. Can you tell me what the truth is about the situation that, that's being faced by people I care about? So I think that it is more important to ask questions sometimes and to think we have the answers, right? That's Absolutely. a strategic tool. To yeah. say, as opposed to coming in with, I know what God says, how about we ask questions? Because the news right now, we're flooded with all different people telling us what they think is happening in Gaza, for example. I think we've got to find real people who might be proximate to the situation and say to them, would you please tell me what is happening there? What have you seen? What do you know? So that we get better informed about what is needed to repair that 
right? And we don't have to go abroad just to ask questions. We can ask questions about things that are happening in our neighborhoods or in our cities. You know, what's really happening at that school? I wonder why the enrollment is so low there. I wonder what's going on in such and such a thing. Can you inform me about what happened in that situation? You know, I, um, I, I went to court with college students and I, I, I don't generally show up at court, but I, I promised I would go. Just sitting in the courtroom and listening to both sides of the issue was informative to me mm -hmm. because I had questions about what is this really about? But I was clear and understood the role I needed to play because I heard the situation and the, and the problem for myself. Mm -hmm. So that would be a tool that we could begin to implement like Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Ask the right questions. Mm. Amen. Amen. So what would you like readers to most take away from the book? That we're needed. We're needed now. <laughs> and we're needed, I think, like Nehemiah, to become people who are not in this for um, recognition. We're not in this for name, you know, or to, to rule or to demonstrate our prowess or our intellect. We're here to convene people, to organize people. So I'll tell you this, and I, I'm very grateful for your audience and who's listening. I realized that because we have been socialized in our faith so individualistically, I didn't know how to do community organizing. I took a Harvard class online with a, a, a person who marched with Dr. King, who mm. was uh, with years with Cesar Chavez and the farm work, workers movement. He is now a Harvard professor. His name is Dr. Marshall Gantz. But he dropped out of college when he was 19 years old during the civil rights movement. And he now teaches how, do, how to do community organizing organizing, mm -hmm. right? But uh, for people all around the world, I would say that I think what I would say to people who are listening, we have got to figure out how to work collectively. And if that means we need to take courses, if that means we need to read this book, Empower to Repair, where I try to share some of the principles I've learned, I think we've got to understand that there are environmental and climate crises. There are, are immigration and refugee crises and asylees. There are, are wars and there's political corruption. There are things that we could could be involved in, in addressing if we would begin to understand that we are people who have been called to the kingdom to repair broken systems around us. Mm. And I pray that we'd be motivated to do that because we've got a generation of young people who are looking at the quote unquote church and they don't see the relevance of it. And I want these young people who are following us not to give up on the church. They haven't given up on God, but they're wondering if we've created these kind of cloistered communities where we just are with an echo chamber of people who agree with us. Yeah. I think reconciliation and reparations are two sides of the same coin. Mm. They were never meant to be pulled apart. We are to be people who repair uh, the, the breach. And we're also to be people who are reconciled to God and each other. And we work together toward the, in, the, the image of the kingdom of God being revealed through us. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that motivates and compels us all to get involved because we're living in a world that needs us. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light. And we don't hide it under a bushel. This is when we need to take the lid off and let our light so shine that others can see our good works and glorify our God in heaven. And that's my deepest prayer for us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the concept of finding your next calling. Um, you've been a professor for many years. You've been an author for many years, which also means you're, in essence, a solopreneur. Um, so what led you to, to do that, to particularly go off and start writing books? Well, um, I think part of what we do for all of us is if we are sensitive and, and inquisitive and open to watching God lead us, I think we follow the breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. Basically, I didn't start out thinking I would ever write a book. I'm surprised as anybody else, right? Um, but I am a person for whom my heart is wired with words. It's how I preach and how I, you know, communicate. But I also became very aware that you can't be physically present everywhere. So I, I watched God open doors for me. I watched messages that I preached 
uh, in various places, uh, major conferences where people would ask for the transcript of it. And that began to help me to understand that what I was saying needed to be repeated. And if I could figure out a way to take what comes out of my heart when I'm preaching um, and put that into writing, that that would become a tool, if you will, that could help more people than me traveling around the country and trying to preach it all out. So I think I saw a need for what it was I was saying, and I felt that I had a partnership with others who said, we think those words should be put in print. Would you do the work for that? And I just followed that kind of call, and it led to the five books that I've written. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about the topic of discernment. Do you have any processes that, that you use, you know, to make important decisions, decide which projects to undertake or, you know, which directions to, to choose? Yeah, I thank you for the question. And discernment, I think our spirituality as Christians really, you know, we're not supposed to just assume that that's there. I think we're supposed to really press into it. I grew up in a Pentecostal church where people listen for the voice of God all the time. So I thank God for them, those uh, saints of God that I grew up around, because they believe that God speaks to us. So I think it begins with a, a, a close relationship with to the heart of God, where we lean our ear toward God and ask for guidance. And I do. I really, really do. So part of my discernment is through prayer and my own spiritual practices of listening for what God might be nudging. I think when God is nudging, we see various times that that same thing comes up and it starts to kind of go, either this is um, coincidental or, you know, may, maybe serendipitous or maybe there's a sovereign thing happening here because I'm getting regular things that are coming my way. Someone who might say, hey, we'd be really interested in that book if you'd like to talk about that with us. And I'm like, oh, they approached me. So there are certain things that kind of seem like a door is opening for you, right? But then I think we always have to discern in community. I don't think we hear God in isolation. We hear God in community. So I have a team of people who pray with me, who love me, who've known me for decades. And I bring those kinds of things to people who will tell me the truth. And we pray together as I I try to choose what, what God might be saying to me because we don't hear God in a vacuum. I think we hear God in community. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, th those are same tools that I recommend <laughs> for people. Absolutely. You know, paying attention and listening and particularly when you hear things multiple times and have a, you know, kind of a group of strategic advisors informally, you know, to bounce things off of. And, you know, I, those are all what I consider to be best practices, you know, in, in making important decisions. Amen. Me too. <laughs> so other than, than that, what advice do you have for someone who's just maybe getting started considering, you know, going off on their own and being a solopreneur? Well, I think that it starts with um, purpose. Um, I think the motivation has to be rooted in purpose. My, I have a purpose statement. My purpose is to inspire and empower the next generation of Christian leaders to become practitioners of reconciliation in their various spheres of influence. That purpose statement is what continues to clarify what I am supposed to do. I went to, this is true, No, I've not said this on any podcast, so this is just for you. Our dear, dear, dear friend of mine and colleague, we both went to an Oprah Winfrey um, kind of, she was traveling the country and she was doing this live your best life kind of um, uh, rally around the country and people would come and my friend and I went. And long story short, uh, at that conference, we were given uh, all these tools and books and things and uh, journals, and we were asked to, to, to say, what are we here for? What has God, what has God made us to do, right? And, um, and as I sat down with my friend, I realized that I was born to give voice to the truth using words that inspire and empower people to embody or articulate it for themselves. That's what I'm trying to do. I write books. What calls me to do what I do is I'm always driven by purpose. And I would say to anybody listening to us, it's not about being famous. It's not about making money. It's not about being getting your face on a cover or anything like that. Real, real life-changing work comes when we're able to say, this is driven out of my sense of purpose. And then I think we put it in the earth and we let God take it and we let God do with it what God chooses to do with it. But it comes, it's birthed out of a sense of purpose, 
that allows us to give our, our best to whatever it is we feel called to do. Excellent. Excellent. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> so um, I know you're in the midst of, you know, a new book launch, uh, but I have to ask you, are there anything else on the horizon, whether it's new books or other new projects that you're able to talk about at this point, or is that too far off? Yeah, I see, right now I feel like this might be my last one. I'm not sure because I've written five and I've said a lot, if not all, that I really want to say in the most practical and straightforward ways. This is most, you know, even from the cover, you can tell this is my most direct and challenging, <laughs> and, you yeah. know, so I didn't pull punches on this one. So I feel like I've become who I want to become and I've said what I want to say. I'm always open to whatever God might lead me to do next. But right now, I'm trying to be much more of a person who is focused on helping to empower and inspire leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I do that? How do I fan the flame of those that I see coming who may not have the platform that I have, but they are as capable and as qualified to be heard as I am. So I, I am motivated to continue multiplying this work by investing in the lives of leaders coming behind me. Cool. Well, if they come out with new books, send them my way, if you could, please. <laughs> <laughs> I will indeed. So again, the title of Brenda's new book is Empowered to Repair, Becoming People Who Mend Broken Systems and Heal Our Communities. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Um, go check it out at uh, Brenda's website, saltermcneil.com. Um, Brenda, you know, many congratulations, and thanks so much for spending some time with us to share all your wonderful work been my absolute pleasure. It's always a joy to be with you. And I thank you for the for the depth that you take these interviews into. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, time. thank you. Thank you very much.